Hi, everyone. It's Tracy Kawa of American SPCC, and we are back with A Brighter Future Starts Here. We are so excited today to have back Dr. Jay Harvey, who joined us once before earlier this month, and uh, I guess we didn't scare you off, huh? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So thank you for joining us. I know that last last month you mentioned to me how you like to give information to the parents. You like to educate parents and caregivers so that they can make their most educated decis decisions and choices when it comes to their kids. Correct. So today we're back for you to give information to us about childhood obesity and for a conversation regarding that. So tell us a little bit about the statistics. Let's start there. Is childhood obesity compared to the past getting worse, staying the same, getting better? Well, unfortunately, uh, it's been getting steadily and progressively worse uh, over mm -hmm. the past multiple decades uh, across all age groups as well and across all across both sexes. Um, the estimates vary, but I'd say over the last three decades or so, uh, what's considered childhood obesity has increased something in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent in our country. Uh, estimated 20 to 25 percent of our kids are considered to be overweight and somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent of our kids are considered to be obese by current standards. So um, that's not good. That's uh, not good. And there are many things, um, you know, uh, that we can do to help uh, hopefully stem those numbers from increasing further. Okay, so then let's define what the difference is between being overweight and being obese. So currently for children, uh, the, the best uh, way we have of assessing that uh, is through body mass index. Uh, however, body mass index uh, is rather an imperfect uh, method for measuring how fat you are for lack, for lack of a better lack of a better way of putting it. Why is that? Um, Why is it imperfect? Uh, it's imperfect for several reasons, but most importantly, it, it has a hard time taking into account the many different ages and stages that kids pass through from uh, infancy to toddlerhood to school age, and then, of course, the pubertal years into adolescence. Um, there really is no mechanism for adjusting uh, to the different ways and different time periods during which kids have growth mm -hmm. spurts, don't have growth spurts, increase muscle mass, decrease muscle mass increase uh, body fat in girls, for example, right around the time of puberty. So um, it, it's imperfect, but it's uh, it's also based on data from multiple decades ago. Um, but it's, it's basically all we got <laughs> uh, yeah. for the moment. Uh, and that's, um, for the most part, how we use to generally uh, classify whether a child is uh, overweight uh, is usually said to be about 20% or so above what we'd expect you know, for their height, uh, obese is considered to be <clears throat> roughly about 50% uh, above where we think they'd be for their height and age. And then morbidly obese, uh, the worst is 100% or double what we'd ordinarily expect. Wow, that, that's, a, that's alarming if, if those yeah. rates are increasing. You know, I remember when my oldest son throughout the years as he was growing up, he would get chunky, then he would shoot up in the air, then he would get chunky, then he would shoot up in the air. Is that common? Yeah, that kind of speaks to uh, the different stages that I was referring to before. Um, for example, birth to two is the most rapid period of growth in your entire life other than puberty. Uh, two to four-year-olds, the toddlers, for example, uh, typically will experience what we call the toddler appetite slump. Uh, that's when a lot of kids will suddenly get finicky, uh, become disinterested in food. You know, they'd rather do a million other things that's to eat. Uh, they may have had a wide variety of foods to start, and now, you know, there's only three foods to eat, and they'll eat that for a month, and they won't eat anything else. And this tends to obviously drive, <laughs> drive yeah, parents up crazy. a wall. Uh, yeah, uh, and understandably so. I went through the same thing with my kids, certainly. Uh, and it's easy to point fingers at somebody else and say, I can't believe 
be having nice. peanut butter and jelly, you know, every day. Uh, well, you know, sometimes good luck, you know, getting them to have anything else. But yeah. there are, of course, things that we can do and certain traps and pitfalls to not fall into during that particular stage. And, and as well as the kids get older. So, um, yeah, so that's how that how that shapes up. Yeah, I, I remember baking um, brownies with spinach in them, like hiding the spinach, right? Because at the time, that was the thing that we moms were doing. <laughs> so that, uh, a lot of that actually arose from a book that was written by Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld's, Seinfeld's wife, wife. Deceptively Delicious. Uh, yeah. And yeah, she had a lot of great and cool recipes in there, ways to kind of hide the, the veggies and stuff that kids tend to frown upon. So uh, I would say you get, you get high marks for employing that technique. All right. Okay. Thumbs <laughs> up for me. Okay. De definite thumbs up. Yes. So what are some of the things that you would say are perpetuating childhood obesity in America today? Well, I think, I think the number one thing that tends to come to mind off the bat is screens. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was little, there really weren't any screens. Yeah. Uh, I guess there was, yeah. a, there was a TV screen and that was yeah. about it. Uh, and that was maybe one per household. It was pretty limited, uh, you know, in terms of the access you had to it. There weren't that many channels, weren't that many shows anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and now in the last two, three, four decades, obviously there's been an explosion uh, of screens, um, such as the one I'm communicating with you on right now, okay. uh, as a matter of fact. So uh, that's a biggie uh, because it has led to not only kids getting kind of fixated on it, uh, but it's also uh, resulted in a lot of uh, kids remaining indoors instead of being outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a, a negative factor. Certainly, uh, the pandemic has compounded this problem as people were, yeah. you know, forced in many instances to kind of shut down and isolate. And uh, we've seen a lot of kids whose weight, you know, has picked up five, 10% uh, in the last year or two. Uh, even kids who were, you know, very fit, uh, healthy eaters, you know, they couldn't participate in their sports and their outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, when you're, you know, closed in in the house, uh, you know, the two things you're probably going to do are look at your screen and eat. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then when you, you know, minus out exercise from that, if the child was pretty active, uh, it's pretty easy to understand, you know, how that compounded the problem. Exactly. Yeah. You know, just speaking of the comparison of screen time and, and even just the comparison of TV from then to now, I remember when kids' TV shows used to end on the half hour. So we as parents would time that half hour and then rush in there and shut off the TV. But now they end at such weird times. So the kids are like, no, there's only like 15 more minutes because it just started. And then, you know, I feel from my experience, I feel bad turning off the TV. So <laughs> there's just so much that has changed. Right. And that's only one little small example. Well, plus, I mean, there's between that and the streaming and the apps. I mean, there really is no technical beginning and end to Thanks. anything anymore because stuff points. can be recorded and played back. And um, yeah, it's again, it's easy to understand, you know, how this all evolved. Uh, the question is, you know, what do we do to kind of strike a much better balance uh, going forward? That's great, because that's actually my next question to you. So what, where does a parent start? What is, what is the beginning of this? So I think probably the most important message, if a parent is dealing with a child who is overweight or obese, regardless of age, is that it's a family affair. Uh, and none of the remedies or methods that we'll discuss um, are likely to be successful in the long term uh, if all family members are not more or less on board with the strategy or the approach. So um, because it often is the case where you might have two or three or four siblings in a family mm -hmm. and not all of them may be overweight. Uh, some might right. be underweight, some might be just right, some are active, some are sedentary, and all, you know, variations in between. So uh, clearly singling out uh, the overweight child for, you know, special or restrictive diet, uh, that's not going to work yeah. uh, in the long term. Uh, clearly the parent, you know, having mashed potatoes and gravy and fried chicken, you know, while the, you know, 
child is given a piece of salmon and some carrots, you know, that's not going to work over the long term. So uh, the focus also can't be on weight uh, solely or appearance, even worse. Um, The approach has to be, uh, for lack of a better term, healthy lifestyle. Um, involving not just the food choices, you know, that we make and the amount uh, that we consume, uh, but combining that with uh, a lifestyle that includes daily activity uh, mm-hmm. and being outdoors in the fresh air and the sunshine whenever whenever possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, those things we know from experience over time um, definitely set the table uh, for, you know, not trending in the direction of being overweight or obese. Um, I think the main message is, you know, as we know, uh, the the primary role uh, as parents, we are, we're the role models, Uh, we're the example setters for our children. And uh, that won't always be true for their lifetime, but certainly when we when we have them young, uh, that's our opportunity to try to instill in them, uh, you know, the notions of, of what we consider to be, you know, uh, a healthy habits and a healthy lifestyle. And to the extent, you know, that we say, you know, do as I say, not as I do, yeah. uh, you try know, that. <laughs> probably not going to work. And look, there are many uh, families where if a child or two is obese or overweight, the likely it is one or both parents might be. Mm -hmm. Uh, The parents themselves are not necessarily accustomed to the healthiest uh, eating habits, uh, uh, consistent daily exercise. And and perhaps, you know, again, maybe there's, they're working two jobs. Like, you know, there's so many different uh, variables that can uh, impact, um, you know, why someone may not be in their healthiest or most fit state. Uh, And it's very important, you know, from the pediatrician side as well, not to be judgmental in that situation. Uh, And, but at the same time, to stress to the parent that uh, if they really want to encourage a healthy lifestyle and healthy habits for their kids, uh, unfortunately, they're going to have to buy into some degree themselves as well. You know, I can help but think of all the families who have at least one child on a gluten-free diet. So is it a similar kind of situation where the whole family kind of has to partake in that, in those choices? So that I think is a little bit different. Uh, There are kids who uh, might have certain food allergies or sensitivities Certainly, uh, gluten, uh, you know, is at the top of the list. Uh, right. Dairy is another one that's pretty common as well. Right. Um, I don't think, this is my opinion, I don't think if a particular child in the family is gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant, or in fact has celiac disease, the, the worst yeah. form of that entity, yeah. Yeah. that that, com- that compels, uh, you know, all of the family members to be gluten free as well. Uh, just as if a child was allergic to milk, doesn't necessarily uh, banish all of the family members from milk and dairy, although that family might make a choice, you know, to go to other similar non-dairy, you know, type things. Um, I think in that situation where there's an actual medical reason or medical component why a child has to avoid a certain food or food group, that doesn't necessarily have to, you know, fall on the shoulders of, of all of the family members. That said, <clears throat> that all still has to fit within the context of uh, what a balanced diet is, what a normal serving size is, uh, you know, how often we're going to have dessert or soda or yeah. cookies or cake or candy or crackers or chips or pretzels or whatever. Uh, it all, you know, it all has to be part of the game. And if there is a particular uh, food problem, obviously, yeah, you know, you'll take that into consideration as well. Yeah, you're always so yeah. informative. I, I, I would like to run this ticker across the bottom that if anybody has any questions for you or if anybody wants to reach out, Cohen and Schenker Pediatrics is where they can find you. Yes, ma'am. So what is the best way for parents and siblings to support an obese child? So I think it starts early. And I think the... If possible, the best way to support that child is to prevent that scenario from happening in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, and again, it can be you know easier said than done in some instances, but I think the earlier 
the parents begin and the more aware they are uh, about what the, the structure of, you know, healthy eating habits and a healthy lifestyle are, the greater the likelihood they will hopefully, you know, gravitate in that direction. And then hopefully that some of those, um, you know, habits will obviously uh, transfer to their kids o- over the long term. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, birth to two is the most rapid period of growth, as I said, in your entire life, other than puberty. Um, I, personally, in my practice, unless, you know, unless I have a 45 pound one year old or something, uh, I don't, mm-hmm. I love the, I love the chubby kids. I'm not going to lie. Uh, mm-hmm. I love the cheeks. I love the thighs. I the love thighs. squeezing them. I love so everything cute. about it. Yeah, so exactly, just like that. Exactly. Yeah, you're going to make uh, a great grandfather. I love everything about it. Right. Uh, and at a point of fact, yeah. uh, it's the thin kids who maybe aren't gaining weight or growing much or mm-hmm. have much body fat that actually get my attention more than the kids who are uh, a little chubby so to speak right that's a um, concern as well being underweight yeah and, and then rapidly. there's also a big difference between being underweight and being malnourished um i often pointing that out to parents of kids who are just slim uh and perhaps it's uh genetic you know a lot of times if you look at a very thin baby and you look at the mother and her father you're like oh okay well you guys are pretty thin. Uh, and I'm guessing you were probably pretty thin, you know, uh, when you were little too. And they'd be like, yeah, I couldn't gain weight. I was like, all right, well, you know, uh, that's a little bit of family tradition there. So but birth to two, my point was I don't place a big emphasis, you know, no babies going on Weight Watchers, as, a, as I like to mm-hmm. say, uh, you know, between birth and two. Uh, but I think after that, uh, and in particular, uh, if the parents have to utilize any type of uh, daycare setting or preschool setting, uh, you know, in order for the kids to, you know, be supervised and get care, uh, that's where you need to start paying attention and, and take control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it starts with, <clears throat> you know, understanding what a varied and balanced diet is. Uh, it comes from an understanding that even though you may be the uh, unfortunate recipient of a kid who's uh, finicky uh, sure. and, you know, again, only wants a chicken nugget or a French fry or, a, you know, mm. hot dog or whatever the case may be, uh, the trap that most parents fall into in the toddler stage is they get so uh, frustrated. Uh, they get so flabbergasted with the child's refusal. Uh, and then they're fearful that if they don't just kind of break down and give them what they want, that they'll starve. Uh, you know, it, it, it just the train, that's how the train gets off the track. And what I emphasize to them is, first of all, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Okay? Mm. So if a child has a, a crummy eating day, you know, move on, chalk it up. It's, it's going to happen. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean you don't try, but it doesn't mean you have to obsess or make yourself crazy. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're unsuccessful, uh, I think more important over time is to keep offering a variety of foods, uh, even knowing they're likely to be rejected. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're not going to make, you know, 10 pounds of green beans and, and, you know, somehow think those are going to get consumed, you make a little bit. Uh, And certainly you continue to have your salad and you continue to have your fruits and veggies and nuts and seeds, beans, and all the things we would love for the child to, um, to eat. You model that. Uh, You lead by example. You eat those things in front of the child Mm -hmm. uh, because they are watching uh, and they are absorbing and they are paying attention uh, and they may not, uh, comply, <laughs> uh, at least how we might prefer them to comply when they're two or three or four. But lo and behold, at 10 or 12 or 14, you never know, it might kick in. For example, my daughter became a vegan at age 20 something oh, cool. uh, and, and, and remains that way. She's 26 now to this day. And I can quite remember when she told me she was becoming a vegan. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, she was as, she was as, you know, meatloaf right. and mashed potatoes, yeah. you know, as they came. So look, was that because we did something of that? I don't know, probably not. Uh, but that's the other thing I always point out to parents is taste change. Yeah. Uh, and you know, they hate it one day, they love it the next day. Um, and so the point is don't get discouraged. 
keep your eye on the prize. Mm-hmm. You know, know it's a marathon and not a sprint. Keep mm-hmm. modeling that behavior. Keep offering those foods. Don't get frustrated. Uh, and probably most important, don't feel like if a child refuses to have his lunch uh, because it was, you know, a slice of turkey, a piece of cheese, and, you know, a little yogurt and uh, an orange, uh, that doesn't mean if he refuses to eat it, you have to give him the chicken nuggets and the fries and the potato chips and the other things that he's craving. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, the more often you do that, the less motivated and the less incentivized the child will be to ever try anything new or different. Yeah. Um, so you have to be okay with them missing a meal, you know, here or there, yeah. uh, in order to, for the broader message to take hold that, look, Adults have their personal favorite foods. I do. You do, I'm sure. Kids have their personal favorite foods. They're going to have them from time to time. Uh, but it's up to the parent to decide, you know, how much mac and cheese they're going to have. You know, it's like, it just can't be <laughs> seven days a week, uh, you know, right. every meal. So uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. You do it little by little. Yeah, uh, sure. But it's important to stay calm. Don't get angry. Don't punish the child. Um and just stay consistent. And in the long run, dividends will be paid. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. Where does, I'll put it away, I'll put the plate away and he'll eat when he gets hungry come into play? Like how long should, <laughs> how, many, how many meals is that plate good for? <laughs> yeah, so these things come up, I'm glad you brought it up because these things come up, you know, every day. And I think, uh, I don't want to give a dubious answer, but I think it depends. Uh, I'm a believer and I, I try not to, you know, impose my beliefs upon anybody else, but I think kids thrive on routines uh, and schedules. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to be rigid and unyielding and unflinching. But I think, you know, we all like to kind of know what's our schedule for the day, what's coming next. And and when something gets disrupted, even as an adult, we're like, uh, like it just throws we manage, but it, but it throws us off. Exactly. Yeah. So for a child without the same measure of maturity mm. and coping skills, it, it kind of messes with them as well. So if I'm a believer, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner seems pretty standard to me. Uh, certainly between meal snacks are uh, appropriate. So two or three of those. Some parents like the, as the kids get older, the after dinner and before bed, you know, item, whether it's a treat or something healthy. Uh, but I think, yeah, somewhere between five and six opportunities to eat throughout the day, uh, certainly for the school age child and stuff is more than uh, adequate. Uh, younger kids have to eat more often. Their tummies are smaller. And, you know, every couple hours we got to we got to present something to them. Uh, but as they get older, I think that, uh, you know, that type of a schedule is fine. And I think with regard to they'll eat when they're hungry, uh, certainly that's true. Uh, and, and you never want to force them if they're not hungry, because if God knows I eat when I'm not hungry and that doesn't really serve me well. Uh, and so we don't want to encourage our kids to eat if they're genuinely not hungry. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, put it in the fridge or whatever, and, you know, lunch is supposed to be at 12 and now at two, you know, he'll eat it. That's more of a personal family preference kind of thing, in my opinion. Um, I think that in some instances that might give too much control uh, to a three or four or five year old than they um, deserve for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, if you're, you know, if you're a stay at home parent, if you have nothing but time and, you know, uh, you have the inherent uh, latitude and flexibility to kind of change things up on a daily basis, it's not going to throw you off. You don't have three other kids, you know, to worry about, However, All right, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe that works. Uh, right. But I, from my experience, mm-hmm. uh, in most households, that will become problematic at some point. Sure. Uh, and so usually I recommend like if lunch is 12 or 12 30, whatever, um, I let them know it's there, bring them to the table, sit them down, whatever. And I think 30 minutes or so is a reasonable uh, time frame for them to eat. Uh, I know some kids are movers and shakers and they're wandering around and they want to watch TV and come back and they want to play with their toy and then have another two bites. And 
So again, you have your decision to make in terms of, you know, how acceptable that behavior is going to be in your house. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think at the end of the day, uh, 30 minutes or so has gone by. You can give them like the five minute warning. Okay, so 25, lunch is over, you know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. some of the kids will then, you know, finish everything on their plates. Others are like, you know, whatever. Uh, But to me, when the meal is done, the meal is done. Uh, The food goes away. And if they start begging for it the minute it goes away, you know, that tells you everything you need to know, you know, at that point that they were just too busy to, to sure. consume it. And I think, you know, again, you don't have to be angry. It's not a punishment, you know, but at the same time, all right, you do for your three o'clock uh, snack, you know, we'll see you then, you know, and if you're really hungry, you know, you'll, you'll eat it, I assume. So, so that's how I would suggest doing it. Exactly. And that also minimizes snacking in between. Exactly. Tell us about fruit. A lot of kids will reach for fruit. And as parents, you know, one might think that, oh, that's a healthy choice. That's fine. They're not eating. Yet fruit is also high in fructose, which is a form of sugar. So how much fruit is too much fruit? So I'm not sure that there is an amount that may surprise you uh, because the question would become if your child is reaching for fruit, whether it's an apple, a pear, an orange, whatever it might be, um, what might they be reaching for instead if they weren't reaching for fruit? That could be a far worse choice. Um, Yes, fruit is certainly uh, high in sugar, but it's also high in fiber in many instances and other, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals that are very good for them. Uh, Certainly fruits and vegetables are really supposed to be the bulk of what we're all supposed to eat. Uh, So I'd have a hard time discouraging a child uh, from eating fruit or thinking it's too much. Now, granted, if they eat next to nothing else, yeah, they probably have to dial back, you know, the fruit a little bit for sure. Uh, But if I have a kid that's interested in eating fruits and or vegetables, I would generally tell the parent to encourage that rather than than discourage that, right? Got it. So let's shift gears for a minute. Yeah. Can we talk about how self-esteem plays into childhood obesity? Yeah, well, think about it. Um, Even as adults, and some people might not be willing to admit this, but if you see a morbidly obese uh, person at the store, at your workplace, whatever, where does your mind go? Uh, Is it a loving and approving and, you know, wonderful thought or do some other thoughts, you know, cross through your brain and then scale that down to children uh, who have no filter, uh, who tend to just say whatever comes to mind and whatever Mm -hmm. they think. Um, This uh, being overweight or obese as a child uh, can have a profound impact on the child's uh, self-image and self-esteem and obviously not in a positive way. Uh, Our society, well, I think it's evolving uh, and people are, um, we'll say more accepting uh, of different shapes and sizes of of human beings. And it's, you know, don't uh, the the focus on thinness, you know, maybe not perhaps as great as it was, you know, a few years ago, but it's still there, but it's still there. Uh, And being fit or uh, looking good is still uh, for a lot of people, a societal norm that they strive for. Uh, And if you're viewed as something other than, uh, yeah, there's a tendency not only to be made fun of, bullied, you know, ostracized, there's social outcast, um, then you start to look at yourself in the mirror, not like what you see, negative thoughts start to float into your mind. And I think as we know, since we tend to blame our parents for everything anyway, uh, you know, our words, uh, while, you know, they may have no ill intent uh, at the time, kids remember. Uh, and you have to be really careful uh, with the child who is overweight or tending that way. Uh, you have to be careful with your verbiage because we want them to have a very positive uh, body image. Uh, body image, again, feeds right into self-image, which feeds right into self-esteem and confidence and all of those things. And as we know, uh, in this cold, hard world we live in, if you're lacking uh, in those areas, 
you know, your road isn't, isn't easier. It's, it's much harder. So, um, so self-esteem is huge. Uh, and again, I think ultimately if we're able to prevent that scenario so much, the better, uh, but if it already exists in one or more kids, uh, again, we have to be very mindful, uh, of their self-esteem and their self-image. Uh, we have to emphasize that, you know, uh, the human body comes in all shapes and sizes. There is no right size wrong size good size mm-hmm. bad size uh we're Diversity. all constructed differently and we're all beautiful in our in our own way uh and i think we also have to be mindful as parents since we uh, well some of us i'll include myself tend to be self-critical uh, you know if a child hears you referring to mm-hmm. yourself and your body in a negative way i'm so fat uh, you, know, it, you know you may not um you may not realize it, uh, but they hear it all. Hear they see it all. Uh, and again, it may not cause any particular type of reaction at the moment, but over time, these messages are received. And what we can't control is exactly how the child will interpret them. Uh, but many times they internalize it and interpret it in ways that we later on really wish they hadn't. Uh, and again, there's no you know, malfeasance or no ill intent on the part of the parent. It's, you know, we grow up from childhood and we have certain feelings about ourselves and how we look and how we act. And, and sometimes we say stuff. Uh, and sometimes our kids happen to be in the vicinity. We're not necessarily talking to them. Uh, we're just talking out loud. Uh, and so I think again, that, uh, role model, lead by example, speak positively of yourself, try to, uh, you know, do the healthy things within your family context uh, is the number one way to uh, not only support your child's health and well-being, uh, but connected to that would be their self-image and self-esteem. You mentioned a number of times the concept of emotion or negative feelings arise. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, walking through this for a moment, Right. A child's negative feelings arise. They don't really know how to process these emotions. And then they might reach for something to comfort the emotions, which is more food. So in a way, it's a vicious cycle that's perpetuated. You're 100 percent right. That uh, that is commonly referred to as emotional eating. Mm. Uh, And look, adults do it. I've done it. I'm I'm probably sure you've done it. Most people have done it at one point or another, uh, using food for comfort, using food for security to feel good in the moment, and then oftentimes feeling bad uh, afterwards. Uh, But in the moment, uh, especially Mm -hmm. in times of stress or duress or or low mood, it's all it's all too common, uh, and certainly if we're uh, you know susceptible to that as adults, uh, a child is even more susceptible to that. Right. Well, you're talking yeah. to a self-proclaimed chocoholic, so I'm just gonna put I'm that right, right out there. there with you. <laughs> Putting it right out there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So where yeah. does obesity become an eating disorder, and and even the reverse, where the lack of eating. Where does that become an eating disorder? And how does a parent diagnose the difference? Yeah. Uh, Well, several things. First, of course, um, what we traditionally think of uh, when we hear the word eating disorders is usually anorexia and bulimia. Those are probably the the ones people are most familiar with. And and I, I would say those are not particularly common younger than say eight or so, although it has occurred. Can you define uh, them more. just in case we have somebody in the audience who doesn't know what yeah. anorexia and bulimia are? Can you just define them quickly for us? Yeah. So, well, eating disorders in general, they're mental illnesses. Uh, they're a mental health uh, issue whereby someone becomes very uh, preoccupied, obsessed uh, with their weight, their appearance, physical activity, uh, to the point where it causes them harm. Uh, mentally, physically, or otherwise. And that could take uh, multiple different forms, uh, anorexia, meaning, you know, calorie restriction. Um, They often have uh, what we call distorted body image, Uh, looking in the mirror, they could, you know, they could be skin and bones, but they think they're fat and overweight. And um, that particular entity, that is a tough one, uh, because the uh, distorted body image that they uh, possess 
it is, and I work with many anorexics and bulimics during my training in New York. I mean, it is, it is tough to overcome. Uh, they, they believe it, you know, you can, you can talk to them and you can demonstrate things, but yeah, they're so fearful, uh, of gaining weight, uh, that they'll do almost anything to avoid it, uh, including taking laxative diuretics, you know, enemas, they'll, you know, they'll wake up in the middle of the night to exercise or run on the treadmill, you know, so they, they won't gain any weight. Um, that, that's a tough one. Mental, uh, or rather eating disorders in general are a tough, tough is classification that, of mental illness. So. Is that a, is that a mental illness or is it a matter of control or is the control related to the mental illness? Oh, the control is related, but it's definitely, they're considered, uh, mental illnesses essentially. Um, and, the primary factor there uh, at least for anorexia and bulimia is distorted body image is it um, visual it, like they literally see themselves as being overweight or is it that there's something in their mind telling them or they're afraid of it i i'm a little confused on that yeah. point yeah so obviously there's a lot of variables and factors that go into why they think that Okay. Uh, and that can be for many different reasons, from the parents placing too much focus on weight or appearance to uh, sometimes they'll be in maybe they're doing their ballerinas, maybe they're gymnasts, maybe they're oh. uh, uh, yeah, there Wrestling. could be an over focus on weight and appearance weight from their uh, various activities that they're doing. So there could be any number of things that move them in that direction in terms of what a normal healthy body looks like. Uh, and wow. um, yeah, I think those are those are some of the contributing factors for sure. But over time, the brain, the way their brain works, uh, yeah, it's their their body image is definitely distorted from reality. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, it can be remedied, but it's it's a long process. Wow. H how can yeah. a, a parent identify if their child has an eating disorder? So I think when they're younger, uh, you're not going to see, so let's say less than eight or 10 or something like that. You're not going to see a, a, a lot in the way of uh, at least uh, anorexia and bulimia type eating disorders. Uh, what we usually see in the younger kids are what we call aversion or avoidant or restrictive type of disorders, whereby literally the sight, smell, touch, taste of food just repulses them. Like food touching, uh, food touching each other. That would be another one. Yes, exactly. Right. Got to have those. That's a little OCD, and sometimes OCD is you know tied into these types of things as well as are other mental health conditions for sure, okay. anxiety and depression, and um, you know there's a lot of overlap in all of these areas for sure. Uh, but they're all kind of you know mentally or emotionally based. But for kids, we see that a lot more often. <clears throat> and some of those kids have other conditions. For example, uh, autistic kids often have sensory issues and uh, that can lead to certain feeding aversions. They don't like crunchy, they don't like soft, mm. they, they don't like uh, uh, just again certain odors, even visually, they just don't like the way something looks and they won't wow. let it go anywhere near their mouth. So, um, so you see that a lot more in younger kids. In, in bigger kids, I think um, uh, some of the early signs to be, uh, uh, be on the lookout for, one would be <clears throat> if their eating habits or their diet suddenly changes. Uh, okay. mom, I'm, I decided I'm going to be vegan, uh, or I decided I'm not going to have any carbohydrates, uh, anymore, mm. uh, or I'm eliminating fat. And like, they just haven't said that or really done that before. So a sudden change in their, their dietary habits is one, uh, wanting to eat alone and not in front of, uh, or with other family members is another one oh. uh, to be mindful of. <clears throat> and why, it, why would that be? What's that? Why would that one be? Because they don't want you to see what they're eating, be it too much, too little, or all of one thing and nothing of another. Uh, they Throwing want some that to away. be secret and private so they can do what they think they need to do without their parent telling them they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so again, if that's not something they had typically been doing before, that is something I would you know, definitely pay attention to. Um, likewise, if they're running to the bathroom, uh, before and or after meals in particular, uh, especially quickly, that could be an indication, um, uh, they've taken something to help get rid of it. Uh, there could mm -hmm. be binging and purging, you know, sometimes there's that as well. Um, 
Uh, and if they are in athletics, especially athletics that tend to place a high focus, uh, gymnastics is one that certainly pops to mind. Wrestling for boys, uh, where they have to, uh, you know, make weight in order to participate, you know, in their matches. Yeah. We do see eating disorders in boys. A lot of yeah. people think we think we don't, but we certainly do. Yeah. So, uh, so those are some of the highlights that uh, pop to mind, uh, you know, right away in terms of what to be on the lookout for. So a lot to be on the lookout for when it comes yeah. to parenting and child rearing. So bring this home for us. What last words of advice would you give to parents and caretakers regarding childhood obesity and it being a family affair and just eating disorders in general? So I think a uh, take home message would be um, if you're a new parent, uh, say with you know, one child perhaps planning on having other children, uh, have an awareness, uh, have a plan, start early, uh, focus on kind of, you know, preventive measures, always better to prevent a disease or a problem rather than try to fix it once it's occurred. Uh, and I think the methods that we touched on today, uh, probably most important uh, being uh, uh, trying to present yourself as a role model or an, or an example of what we would like our mm -hmm. children to do. Uh, with respect to eating habits and activity and outdoors and stuff like that. Uh, again, in the early going, uh, we have that unique opportunity to influence our kids uh, you know, before a lot of other people uh, get their hands on them. So um, if those things are important to us, uh, the chances are greater uh, that that will be important to them. Uh, also remember that um, – once obesity takes hold, uh, whether in a child or a teen, uh, the longer that child remains overweight, the greater the likelihood they will take that into adulthood uh, mm -hmm. and experience the secondary ramifications such as diabetes and hypertension mm -hmm. and high cholesterol, high triglycerides, liver, kidney, heart, um, all the things that, again, we uh, you know, hope to help them avoid, hope to avoid for ourselves, uh, really become pl problematic uh, once the problem has manifested and the longer it takes to kind of um, address, um, you know, those things become greater and greater risks. But at the same time, understand um, if a child is overweight or obese, they didn't get there in a day and they're not getting out of there in a day. Uh, so you have to kind of commit to do things uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion, little by little. Major changes for kids, just as in adults, don't tend to uh, be very favorable or take hold uh, very well. Uh, so, you know, marathon, not a sprint. Uh, look for progress, not perfection, all the usual cliches. Uh, and be persistent and consistent, and these issues can be overcome. And if they are overcome, there's a lot of evidence to suggest, especially before adulthood, that even if a child was at greater risk of some of these other uh, health issues down the road, if the problem is remedied before they become adults, uh, those risks disappear. Uh, so there is something that we can do to fix it if it's already occurred. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And Dr. Harvey, you raised also some really great points about um, eventually if these eating you know, disorders or if um, obesity becomes unchecked, it can develop into adult diabetes and which opens the door for a whole other conversation at some point on no childhood diabetes. So thank yes, you so much for being with us today for uh, Obesity Prevention Month, Obesity Awareness Month. We appreciate you coming on the show on your one day off and really imparting this wisdom so that we as parents can make healthy choices and guide our kids the best we can and make the most educated decisions. So thank Absolutely. you as always. If you wanna find Dr. Jay Harvey, you can find him at Cohen and Schenker Pediatrics, S-H-E-I-N-K-E-R. Cohen and Schenker Pediatrics. So thank you again, Dr. Harvey. It's My always pleasure. a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Hang on just one second. I'm just going to do that a quick outro. So sure. if you know of anyone in your community who is doing amazing things with children and families, we definitely want to hear about them. We'd love to interview them. Contact us at info at AmericanSPCC.org. And remember, 
a brighter future starts here.